Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 323. Once you get through that fear and really embrace what you want to do, things start lining up and falling into place. Attention gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, Gift Biz Gal, Sue Monheit. Hi there. You are the best for tuning in today. I hope you're having a great summer so far. Getting out again, being with friends, going to beaches and museums, all the things that were out of our reach last summer. I have to tell you, a couple weekends ago, I had plans Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. That used to be pretty standard for me, but come Monday, I was exhausted. What I'm learning is balancing social and home time leads to a much better quality of life for me. So I'm really working on protecting my time and not completely reverting back into the social craziness that was before. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not like Michael and I are super popular or anything. It's just that, well, going out is fun, but I'm definitely toning it down. We'll see how that goes. Given in about 30 days or so, I am back into full travel mode. Let's talk about what's happening on the show today. Have you ever felt stuck or like you're just going around and around with something and you just can't get out of that continual circle? You keep doing things that aren't sitting well with you over and over again because it's just become a routine. Like how I was going out every night of the weekend, or always doing the same thing over and over again with the kids instead of finding something new and exciting and different, or staying in a job that gives you less than zero satisfaction. And if you don't see it in yourself, I bet you see it in others. Friends that always talk about what they'll do in the future, and then the future gets pushed further and further out with no action taken. I think we're all guilty of this at some time or another. The important thing is identifying it and getting out of that rut, because there's so much out there in life to experience, and as time goes by, our dreams and goals could escape our grasp. No matter what your age, we're all getting older. And the ability to fulfill our intentions at a future time is never guaranteed. Or it's put on uncontrollable pause, as we have all learned. That's why I'm really appreciative of the conversation that you're going to hear between me and Becca. We have a deep down chat about what keeps us stuck and how to move past it to go for what we want. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Becca Ribbane. Becca is on a mission to help people break out of the cycles of uncertainty and struggle that hold them back. She helps women who are going back and forth with the big, seemingly endless question of what to do next. They can stop going around in circles and finally figure out what they truly want and create the clarity and momentum they crave. Too many people find themselves stuck and unsure of their direction. Through her clarity journal, using journaling prompts, Becca helps people become more honest with themselves. This moves them forward gently and empowers them to embrace their strengths while letting go of any negative self-talk that has held them back in the past. Becca, welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Thank you so much for having me. As I've just been going through your intro, I am so curious and so excited about getting into the topic but I'm going to delay it for just a second because I want to ask you another question that's become a tradition here on the show. And that is, if you were to describe yourself in a little bit of a deeper level for our listeners through a motivational candle, describe to us what this candle would look like. So a color and a quote or some type of saying that would resonate with you, what would be your motivational candle? That's such a fun question. I love that. (laughs) So my motivational candle would be the aquamarine of the Caribbean. And it would have a quote on it saying, be here now. 
Be here now. Tell me about that. You know, when I had little kids, I actually had on Etsy made a bracelet that said, be here now, just to remind me to come back to center. Usually when I use candles, I'm meditating. So I feel like that's a really good reminder for pulling myself back during like when I'm frazzled and frenetic, because so often we are. Yeah, I agree with you there. You know, what comes to mind with me is to be in the moment of where you've chosen to be at the time. Right. Because sometimes, especially when you have family, if you're at work, you're thinking, oh, I should be with the kids. And then if you're at the kids, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, okay, what's that next Facebook ad going to look like? Or, you know, and to stop that side conversation and just be present where you are at that time. Right. Because if you don't, then you're not doing either well. Right. Right. And it's just so much more clarifying to use some of the words that I know we're going (laughs) to get into here and just being present. And so it's more clarifying and more fulfilling for yourself too. Not to be second guessing like you always should be somewhere other than you are at the current moment. Well, and to give your full attention, especially with the kids, with the kids and the cell phones, it's so easy to like, oh, one second, kiddo, I'm going to respond to this text and that text Mm -hmm. becomes 20 texts. Yeah, so true. All right. So you've piqued my curiosity here too. Bracelets on Etsy? Yeah. There's a whole, if you type in, they usually are like name bracelets, but you really could put anything in like engraving. Like they have tons of different Mm -hmm. necklaces, bracelets. I bet you could get earrings. And I actually use them whenever I have a new mantra, I usually get a piece of jewelry to go with it to actually physically remind myself. I think some people use tattoos. <laughs> I use jewelry from Etsy. Probably better because if you're going to change over time, it's kind of like the word of the year. What's your word of the year? <laughs> you can't see me right now, but I'm wearing a necklace with just like a metal rectangle. And on the back of it, like facing me, it says inevitable. And I use it to remind me that like all the hard work is inevitably building. There you go. Wonderful. So share with me a little bit of your journey of how you got to where you are today. Give us some background here. So I've been a career coach for 14 years. I love helping people through this struggle of going back and forth about what they want to do next. I think sometimes they say those who can't teach. (laughs) So the way I got into this is because when I have been at various phases of my life struggling, I've done a lot of reading and research and then I naturally end up helping pull my friends and now clients through that journey so that they can do it a little bit quicker than I did. Mm, Yeah. It reminds me that even 20 years ago, there was no next. You chose a career and that was what you did for your life, whether you liked it or not. We're so fortunate now, just the way culture is and, and acceptance of the fact that you can change jobs. Right. Well, and I think because of that, it makes it hard to teach younger people how to do it because their mentors didn't necessarily have the same options. And so like for perspective, I graduated a little bit less than 20 years ago from college and they give you all of this information about what they say you're going to do with your life and where you can apply what you've learned into the real world. And I just kept finding person after person after person graduates college. And four years later, they have this moment of true, like that dark night of the soul type moment where it's like, this is not what I want. And I don't know now how to pivot into something that I do want. Yeah, you hear that a lot, that either they're so far into their degree, they just are going to finish up, but then never use it. Or they do get a job with what they went to school for. And then several years later, as you're saying, they're just saying, this is not fulfilling. And I can't foresee myself spending another couple of decades doing the same thing, something that I don't like. Yeah. So I'm thinking about our listeners here. And there are two things that come to mind when you talk about this and the fact that we can change and flip and make other choices for ourselves. The first is when somebody makes a handmade product and they are in a career and maybe it's full time and they need to stay there for a while because let's face it, a solid paycheck and insurance 
is kind of hard to leave when you have it, right? Right. So there's that kind of a transition, like when would be a good time or should I even start trying to create my own business on the side? And then I also see another big transition place when people are looking at retiring and they aren't ready to sit on the front porch with a glass of lemonade, (laughs) you know? They want to retire into something that they really are looking forward to doing. So creating a business, again, around something that they make. So I see those two places within a lot of the people that I work with and the people who are listening where there would be points where they'd want to clarify and understand if this is the right thing for them to do. So I think maybe we could take it from there. How do you start making some of these choices? I think the risk would be you either stop your job or you spend money starting something and then also go back to the point where you find that you don't like what you're doing. Right. I think so many people spend a lot of time waiting, like waiting for their job to get better, waiting for the answer to come to them. And you talk about the person at retirement. Well, it is astounding to me how many people I get that are in their late 50s or 60s that are trying to figure out how to change careers entirely just because they can't bear the idea of staying where they are for the last years of their life. I think the older you get, the less able you are to just suck it up. (laughs) Maybe that's not actually true, but I think at all ages, it's sometimes hard to spend a long time in a place that's not working for you. But I would imagine, like having known some of my clients who have gone down the path of starting their own creative businesses, it's that what's really necessary is that realization that you are strong enough, that you have the skills you need and the skills you don't have, you find someone like you, Sue, who can help guide. And you can't really go out on your own and do your own thing until you have that sense of inner strength and inner purpose. And if you're too worried about the finances to even really explore and be honest with yourself about what you want to do next, I think that's where most people that I see get stuck. They get stuck in the fear of even exploring the options. But once you get through that fear and really embrace what you want to do, things start lining up and falling into place. You're so right. I mean, I see this over and over and over and over again is people have these ideas. Well, it's it's with anything, right? It's not just, you know, here, of course, we talk about turning a handmade product into a business, but it's people who say they're going to write a book. Or people who say that when I retire, I'm going to go on this big dream trip or buying your first house. Like there's all those big momentous places in your life, I guess I'd say, where you can make some big changes and people talk about it so much and they stop themselves short. And I think it comes back to what you're saying is they're waiting because they're fearful of the unknown or what you're saying, fearful that they don't believe in themselves enough that they'll be able to accomplish it. So it's easier just to think about it all the time and never really try and do it. But then you never get there either. Right. Or you try to do it in a really small way Mm. and it doesn't work. And then you say, oh, I guess that wasn't going to work. Instead of taking away the real lesson that maybe you need to bootstrap this a little bit better. I find that a lot with like podcasters. We were talking before we hopped on before we started recording about how many podcasters there are right now. Well, I see so many podcasters that do 20 episodes and then give up because they haven't gotten traction. And I'm sitting there like, of course you haven't gotten traction. You've only done 20 episodes. Or for Etsy, I was so impressed yesterday. I went to the playground with my son and this is a playground we go to all the time. And there was this woman setting up a table at the playground with all of her handmade candles and body scrubs and facial products. And she had a beautiful booth and I was tight, went over and I bought a face mask and I was talking to her and she was like, this is the first time I've ever done this, but because of these kids, I wasn't able to go to the pop-up I was supposed to go to. And so I figured, hey, I have to go to the playground to let them get their energy out anyway. Maybe I should just try it at the playground. Oh, that's crazy. But it was such a great life lesson, right? So it didn't work out. It wasn't like she was throwing her kids under the bus. She was just acknowledging reality. She had two small kids, not baby kids, but they were probably like six and eight. And life happens. Sometimes you don't get out of the house and go to the pop-up 
that you usually go to. Let's try the playground. That's where you guys want to be. Yeah. Hopefully she didn't get shut down because I think you need licenses for things like that, by the way. I'm in Seattle. It's a little easier going here. Plus, I think they're pretty forgiving right now. I Hopefully she didn't get shut down. There is a possibility, but I'd like to believe in our neighborhood, people would just leave the woman who was trying to make money for her kids alone yeah. since she wasn't hurting anyone. Yeah, but honestly, but I think what you're saying is right. Like, if one thing doesn't work, then try something else. To your point of people starting in a small way and then almost self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If they start in a small way, they meet their first hurdle and they say, see, I knew it wouldn't work. It's a good thing I didn't really go full force, you know? <laughs> exactly. Whereas it wasn't going to work if you didn't go full force. Yeah. And that doesn't mean money either. I think that's a big thing that fully going for it doesn't also have to equate to having to invest thousands of dollars either. Fully going for it, to my way of thinking, means your heart is in it. You're going to figure it out one way or another with the resources you have available, time, right. money, all of that together. I think if you don't have money, then one of the key points is to find your mentors. And even if I think if you can pay your mentors, that's amazing. Like if you can pay for a coach to really guide you through, that will save time. But even just finding your one friend who's really good at photography and having them tell you what's wrong with your Etsy page. I am always astounded by people who have beautiful creative designs and they show me their Pinterest or their Instagram or their Etsy pages. And I'm like, you're an artist. You can't believe these photos are good. Why aren't you learning from photographers how to take better photos? And I got to say, I'm going to make a shameless plug here. There is so <laughs> much content on podcasts and elsewhere, YouTube, like free content available. I think it's more the commitment. I think a lot of it goes back to, in terms of people not starting, is just believing in themselves and making the commitment. In terms of the quality, like you're talking about there, I think it just gets so overwhelming. There are so many things to do. Almost better to put a picture up that's not of quality than not have it up. But the real story is you won't get the sales if you don't have solid pictures. So let's get into your area of expertise and what I really wanted to talk about today, which is clarifying what that step should be, whether it's the first step into your own business or even life in general. I'm not sure, Becca, where you want to take this, but how do we get people out of being stuck? Oh, I think that is an amazing question. And I think part of it really starts with mindfulness. And I don't mean mindfulness in the sense of going and sitting and meditating for a half an hour a day, but being mindful in the sense of really understanding your motivations, your strengths, and your weaknesses. And when you're reacting out of fear, when you're reacting out of hope, just really being able to sit with yourself and understand exactly where you're coming from and not just react out of habit. And so I love the Clarity Journal because I came up with it actually when I was going back and forth with a friend about what I should do in my business next. And it was really funny because she finally stopped me and she's like, Becca, you're a career coach. You literally help people with this every day. And I laughed and it hit me over the head with it like a tongue in the bricks. And I stopped. And after we got off the call, I wrote down 30 prompts. What would I ask people? As I was working on them, I was like, you know what? This is what I do with people. I just ask them a lot of questions to help them gain that clarity. And it's really easy when you are trying to figure yourself out to just keep looking at the questions the same way over and over again. How many people do you know that when you ask them what they want to do next, their initial response is, I don't know. 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 That it's just a re constant refrain of, I don't know what I want to do next. Well, when I get on with those people, it's so funny to me because within usually 30 minutes, I'll hear, oh, I have this idea, this idea, and this idea, and I can't choose between them. But that's a very different energy space to be in than I don't know what I want to do at all. And I would imagine people who are stuck in that moment right before they open the Etsy shop or when they're trying to decide what it is that they actually want to focus on. Because I know a lot of artists are very multi-passionate. So sometimes I get 
like, I'm not actually sure which direction I should focus in. And so you do know, you know that you need answers to these couple questions and being able to really dive into which of those options uses your greatest strengths, where, if you do follow this path, are you going to need to shore up your weaknesses? Really coming at it from a loving, expansive, but also somewhat methodical step-by-step approach of making sure you've looked at all of the factors that go in. I think that's really important. I also think it's really important to recognize that there is no decision that's 100% right. We are human. We live on earth. Nothing that we do is 100% the right answer where the other answer is 100% wrong. So we're always making these little decisions about how to move us in the direction that we think is best. But the more that you can have a really clear understanding of what that direction looks like, the more you can actually just take concrete steps without going back and forth. Yeah. And I would expand on that too by saying that no decision is irreversible either. Yeah. But indecision just leaves you totally stalled in your tracks. Right. And I would imagine most of the people that are listening to this podcast are really into the concept of building something. And being stalled in your tracks means you aren't building. And even if you end up having to pivot or learn how to take better photos, or if you're a podcaster, you know, keep with it during that period of time where you don't have anyone listening, you're building something. And if you can just keep picturing yourself brick by brick, building up something to the point where it's beautiful and amazing. I think that's a lot less demoralizing. I agree with you there. Something that you said a little bit further back, I want to go back to, and that is when you're talking about mindfulness, you said motivation, strengths, and weaknesses, but I want to key in on motivation. So someone who has a nine to five job, who's deciding, I hate what I'm doing. I am not feeling fulfilled. I just want to start my own business to make money so that I can replace what I'm doing here. And my feeling is if the reason that you're making a jump is only to make money, if it's strictly 100% financial, it's never going to work for too long. And I say that because when it starts getting harder, you jump ship. You've got to have a deeper passion than just, I hate my job I'm doing now. I'm going to try and start up this yarn business, making whatever the product is that they would be making, because I need the money. Do you agree with me? I am like agreeing with you so much that I'm sitting here, I I need to take notes and go back and listen to the audio and be able to quote you on that. (laughs) (laughs) Because it is so true. When you leave a place out of negativity. Like when you leave a place out of a space of, I really hate this place, you are not consciously making a clear decision about your next move. And I think especially for people who end up becoming solopreneurs, there's a book that was out. I mean, it's still out, but it came out years and years ago. I feel like it was an old book when I read it, probably like early 2000s called The E-Myth. I don't know that you've ever talked about that on your podcast, but like the E-Myth. Michael Gerber with the E-Myth, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the E-Myth, one of the big themes is if you're going to own your own business, yes, you need to be the creator. You need to have the vision, but you also need to be the accountant and the marketing slash salesperson. And the book really spends a lot of time talking about how to either embrace all three aspects or to shore up the aspects you can't do. And especially with people who are creators, they end up with a job they really didn't expect. They love making necklaces, but they didn't realize that, that, yes, they were also needed to love sales and accounting and the financial side. And if you're just going into it like, oh, I'm going to follow my passion, I'm going to do my love without being grounded in reality of this is a business. You are not starting a let me knit for my friends nonprofit, you're starting a solid business and you need to be able to function, like to enjoy it for what it is, like that you're building a business. And yes, that business, whatever the outward facing product that you're selling to the world, yes, you will love that and you have passion for it. But you also have to have some passion for the fact that you really want this business to succeed. And that it's not just about the art, 
but it's about the entire package. You are so, so right. And it, I'm glad you added that layer on. And I'm going back to motivation, strengths, and weaknesses. Motivations, we've kind of just covered. You shouldn't be escaping to get to somewhere else. It should be something so heartfelt that you want to do. And then the path, whether you eventually get to leave your nine to five because you've built it on the side and it's grown to a certain level or however that would happen, it shouldn't be the escape hatch. It should be changing and clarifying and wanting to do something different, I guess, for the future. But I was going to make a comment here. I have a program called Makers MBA. It's not open right now. In fact, we just closed the doors for this year. But the very first thing we talk about in Makers MBA is define exactly what you're looking to create. So Makers MBA, as the name would imply, talks about how to build a solid sustainable business from the start to finish. And the very first thing we do is we say, okay, what are you trying to build? Because it looks so great from the outside, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're looking in at somebody or you're looking in on a picture and seeing, let's just say you want a retail shop on Main Street of your community. It looks really nice from the outside. You think, oh, all these beautiful things I'll have in there, etc. But you forget to think about, I've got to staff that store. I've got to go on buying trips. I've got to learn how to price the product. I've got to deal with the lease and all the legal things. And, you know, there's so much more to a business. And so what I really like is what you're talking about with the strengths and weaknesses. And when you're very clear to yourself, number one, on the vision and that you like what you're trying to build. Have you ever heard the saying about building a ladder? And by the time you get the ladder up, you've realized that you're leaning it against the wrong building. Have you ever heard that? I haven't, but I like it. You you take so much time to build the ladder. And then finally, when you're there, it's like, dang, I didn't want to be here. I wanted to be over there. (laughs) Right. But so many people do that. However, getting back to what we're talking about here, the strengths and weaknesses, to your point, when you are really clear and honest with yourself about strengths and weaknesses, and you talked about the ebook, I've seen people who really, really love their craft and they just want to make, but they want to make money off of pottery or whatever it is. So they get someone else in the business, even to be the manager role instead, so that they can continue making. Now, they might not be able to do that right away because obviously you're probably going to have to pay somebody for that. But being clear on where you want to go, and that doesn't mean you're the owner of the business, but you might get somebody else to be, I don't want to call it like a CEO or president, but the one who's doing the business portion of it for you so that you can keep making. Well, someone who's the CFO and the marketer. Yeah. And then you can just keep making and being out at shows as the artist and talking to everybody about how you put things together and doing demos and all of that. But I think early on, knowing what you love the most and thinking about whether that's what you should do, and then you'll get someone else to do some of those business ends or vice versa, wherever it would fall for that particular maker, is important to know and be honest with yourself about. I mean, I make the comment that you could grow so big, you grow yourself out of the love of your business for that reason totally. Mm -hmm. Very much. I think also being self-aware enough to know from the beginning that I want to be the creator. I don't necessarily want to build a business where the business end is going to take up all my time. Gives a lot of direction about the what and the where. Because if you want to be the creator, then maybe opening up a physical store is not the way to go because that's going to have an awful lot of back end. And I don't even know that that's actually the answer for some creators. Maybe having the store would be in some emotional ways less work because they have the buyers coming to them. But it's really being very clear with what you want long term so that you can make those decisions step by step. And also, if you end up making a wrong decision or a decision that turns out not to be as great, you can easily pivot back into the stream of what you want. Yeah, you can make adjustments. But the first thing is really being clear with yourself. And now I'm getting back to the clarity journal here. Mm -hmm. Being clear and honest with yourself too. How do you do that? Like I am not a journaler. I've tried (laughs) meditating at 7,000 million times. (laughs) I keep trying different approaches for it to click for me. So how would journaling help people clarify? Because I think if we're as clear as we can be before we get started, it's going to ease the path moving forward. Right. So how do we do that? 
Are you a journaler? I'm really excited to hear what Becca has to tell us next about journaling and how it can help you with your business. I'll catch you on the other side of this quick announcement from our sponsor. Yes, it's possible. Increase your sales without adding a single customer. How you ask? By offering personalization with your products. Wrap a cake box with a ribbon saying, happy 30th birthday, Annie. Or add a special message and date to wedding or party favors for an extra meaningful touch. Where else can you get customization with a creatively spelled name or fine packaging that includes a saying whose meaning is known to a select two? Not only are customers willing to pay for these special touches, they'll tell their friends and word will spread about your company and products. You can create personalized ribbons and labels in seconds. Make just one or thousands without waiting weeks or having to spend money to order yards and yards. Print words in any language or font. Add logos, images, even photos. Perfect for branding or adding ingredient and flavor labels too. For more information, go to theribbonprintcompany.com. It's all about being honest with yourself, like truly open and honest and not in a negative way, but in a balanced way. One of my favorite questions in the Clarity Journal and one that I use a lot in my day-to-day life with my coaching is who do you envy and what does that tell you about yourself? And I could really imagine that for artists, for creators, that can be a really powerful question to ask yourself. Which of the artists that I see do I envy? We see thousands of artists. There's probably three or four or five that you really wish you had what they had. And when we do that, when we talk about envy so often, we try to push it away. Oh, I shouldn't be envious. Or the envy just becomes all consuming and you don't do anything with it. But when you can really embrace, hey, they did this, that looks like a good path for me, then you can actually break it down step by step. Go read articles about them. Go like look at all of their social media. Go visit their store. You might even be able to reach out to them and ask them if they mind you taking them to coffee. Being able to then recreate it in your own way because it's not cheating to use information that's already out there. And I think so often when we've gone through the school system, if you look at your friend's paper in school, you're going to get a zero. That's not how it works in real life. In real life, we're collaborating and building all together and taking the ideas of other people and then changing them around to make them our own. And so if there are people out there that you really admire and you want to set up your life that way, well, they've given you a blueprint. Well, absolutely agree with you. And I love the idea of connecting up and being able to talk. I warn everybody, if you call somebody and you say, I'd love to just pick your brain, like people don't have time for that. (laughs) You know, like maybe it's someone in your local chamber who you're friends with or somewhere where there can be some give and take, I think is really helpful. But the other question could be when you find that one person that you're talking about, who do you envy? I love this question. And what does it tell you about yourself? Then also another question, if you're able to make that connection and have some conversation is, what are the things that you're challenged with now in your business that you didn't foresee going in to your situation? Mm. And then being honest with yourself, again, because everything can look so appealing when you're not doing it yet. But then when you actually are there and having to put in the hours or let's say you're going to end up being on TV doing a demo of your product or something like all the anxiety that that brings, depending on what type of personality you are. It sounds great to be able to say, oh, I was on TV or, oh, I'm going out to shows. But if you really honestly as a person don't like doing those things... Being able to say that is no good because you've had all the stress and the anxiety of getting to the point to be able to say that. So that's, I think, where we circle back to that honesty with yourself. Honesty with yourself, but also probably talking to people because I had a really interesting experience where I had started Pilates. After my second child, I had all sorts of hip issues. So it was recommended to me to start Pilates. And I don't know that you've ever done Pilates, but usually it's one-on-one. So I had a lot of time to talk to my Pilates instructor and she asked me what I did and I started talking about it. And I talked a lot about how I help guide people through finding mentors, finding people to ask in the industry, because I can't answer all of the questions. What I can do is really help you figure out what questions you should be asking yourself and others. 
And she laughed and she's like, if I had met you and hired you, I would have never become a Pilates instructor. I was like, what? Like, she seems like she loves Pilates. And she said, I didn't realize it was a split schedule. And so I laughed because I would have been able to point that out to her without even sending her to anyone. If you're any type of aerobics instructor or physical fitness instructor, you are working really early in the morning Like you're getting up and you are at the gym by like 5.30 or 6 to help your clients. And then you have the whole middle of the day and then starting at 4 again till about 8, you have a whole nother set of clients. And that's really stressful to be working two distinct blocks and you have this middle of the day and you're actually getting home pretty late, but you have to wake up really early. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. And for creators, you know, if you're going to shows every weekend, all of a sudden you've lost every weekend and those shows are on weekends. And some people love it. None of this is either good or bad. It's just what is the reality of what you're looking to create and does it resonate with you? And are you going to love it? Because why should we go to all this work of getting a business started to close it down two years later? Not because it's not working, but because you don't like it. It's too much work and it's work you don't like when you could have just focused on work you like. Or it's work that you don't like at this point in your life. You have young children at home versus your kids are out of the house. You have more time. Then, like a craft show, like you were just saying, could be wonderful because you crave being with people and having something to do with the weekends. Exactly. There's no one right answer for everybody. And there's no right answer for even one person that's going to be right for 20 years. It's going to change. Growing and evolving, for sure. So I have another question for you that I'd like to touch on, and that is you talk about self-care specifically. And Mm -hmm. how self-care is somewhat of a Band-Aid versus a solution. Right. So what do you mean by, like, give us some depth to that? Well, I think this gets into, there's some real hard challenges in a lot of our lives. You know, if you have kids, it's stressful. If you're trying to work and have a side business on Etsy and you have kids, That's really intense. Or if you don't have a job and you're staying home with kids, because you're staying home with the kids, you guys don't have the financial resources to really throw into hiring a photographer. There's just always these reasons why what we are doing can be difficult and stressful. And I think too often we read the magazines or we watch TV and they're like, oh, here, have a glass of wine or go take a bubble bath. But at the end of the day, those things are great, but the real self-care is setting up your life in a way that you don't hit those huge, stressful, combustible moments in the first place. And recognize that when you have, that is a lack of support in some way that chocolate is not going to solve. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I love chocolate, but chocolate is not going to solve that no one is supporting your business. A glass of wine isn't going to actually make you feel better about yourself. And I think that we really do, that society tells us that these little things are supposed to make us happy when they really can only make us happy in the moment, not long term. Because I hear this all the time too. Like, make sure you're taking time for yourself. Go get a massage. Sometimes treat yourself. Go out to lunch with your girlfriends. Figure out a way to integrate that in because it's going to make you happier. And Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, yeah, those things are important. Like, I know I'm a really private person. I like my time alone. Not always, but sometimes. That's important just for me to rejuvenate. And so if having some of those times is important when it's a break, when you're tired, but not when you're dissatisfied with how your life is set up overall. That is a really great point. And I think that a lot of times when we start telling people that they need to invest in self-care, it's because we see they're dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to bring the satisfaction that they are looking for. Right. I mean, it feels good for the moment because who doesn't want a glass of wine with their girlfriends, right? I love my bubble baths. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. But then the next morning, you're still faced with the same thing if it's not fulfilling for you, which all goes back to really think through what you're looking at doing in the first place and adding that layer of reality over it to try and set yourself up the best you can. 
I mean, I don't want to have this whole conversation and have people listening to us, Becca, and then be like, I'm not doing anything. Like, what if I choose the wrong thing? To your point earlier, like, is there 100% right answer, wrong answer? But I don't want people to be afraid either. I think the overall message, Becca, is really think through and think to living in the scene of what you're trying to create. And to the best of your ability, make sure it's what you really want. Yeah. Well, and I want to go back to a point that we kind of hit on earlier because you were like, oh, maybe they won't respond. The idea of reaching out to people that have been there, done that, I find that people really underestimate how many responses they'll get. I mean, it's not going to be 100%. Certainly, there are going to be people busy all the time. But I find that when you reach out to people that are a little bit more successful, I'm not suggesting you do this with Oprah, that about 10% of them end up responding. You just happen to catch them in a slow week. And it's really about timing. And you can't really be the one who knows the timing. You don't know this person. But reaching out to people can be a really good way of giving yourself both the information you need and the clarity you need to move forward, but also being aware of There's a whole section in the Clarity Journal about finding your friends and mentors and being really aware of who it is that's building you up and who it is that's pulling you down. And I find, especially with people that are solopreneurs, people that have side gigs, a lot of times they don't have the people in their life that are their cheerleaders and cheerleaders in really effective ways. Sometimes you'll have someone who's just, oh, that's wonderful, honey. But like more like in a, I'm patting you on the head and like not really taking you seriously. Kind of condescending cheerleader. Exactly. Versus having someone who truly supports you, but will also tell you that photograph isn't good enough. Gently, nicely, but who's like, have you tried doing it this way instead of this way? And I think that so often we feel like we should just be able to Google all the answers. And yeah, we probably can, but we may not have the experience to filter the information we're getting through Google to really create a solid plan for ourselves. And I think that our whole society really diminishes the idea of needing these mentors that have been there before that really are there to help you move forward who really want to see you succeed, who don't see you as competition, but see you as just another wonderful person in this continuum of art. Like art feeds on itself. The more art there is, the better we are as a society. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. I think that the industry overall is very generous, the whole industry Mm -hmm. of creators and makers. And I see this a lot in some of the Facebook groups, especially when they are industry focused, like candle makers, jewelry makers, my group, Gift Biz Breeze, which are all types of handmade creators. People are very generous. And I will agree with you. So like if someone came into the Breeze, which are all different types of makers, and let's say I was thinking about starting a candle business. So I might reach out and say, hey, would anybody be willing to have a chat with me about the candle industry and what's involved and just sharing? Because I'm thinking of doing this or asking a question, I know there would be people who would reach out. So I will agree with you there that they would do that. It's really helpful to talk to people in the industry. It's really helpful to know people that are further along down a path that you want to go. I'm also thinking observing, even if you were not comfortable with asking the question, if you're in a product specific Facebook group, just see what they're talking about. That's a good point. Just watch what the posts look like and see and then say, okay, these are the types of challenges people are having. I certainly will have some of those too. Maybe not all of them, but some of them, does this feel good to me? Because every business comes with their challenges. Let's get that fact out straight. (laughs) You know, like when I first started in my first business, I was thinking it's going to be so perfect. Like the website's going to be perfect. The products are going to be perfect. Our customer service, top notch, like, oh, you know, on and on and on. Well, yes, that can be the intent, but unfortunately you can't control everything. So there will be challenges. And it actually took me a little while to get the fact that there will always be problems on the table. Always. Like you don't ever get to a point where there is nothing that you have to address. There's always something. But if you're able to really set up your life where 80% of what you're doing brings you joy 
or is like a creative challenge instead of just a drudgery. That's the gold standard, right? Like that is what we all want. Yeah. And problems don't have to equate to frustration or sadness or dissatisfaction or challenges or whatever you want to say are just one thing after another that you have to address. That's all. Right. Well, and if you treat them like puzzles. Yeah. Puzzles. If you treat it like a game or a puzzle and I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to win this round, (laughs) I think it will really help. And the cool thing about having your own business is you get to figure out the solution. You don't have to go back to anybody else and negotiate what you're going to do for a customer who's dissatisfied with something, product arrived late, you know, whatever. You get to choose how you're going to manage things. Right. And there's no one way to do that either. Right. So as long as these are things that you like to work through, great news. No problems. So share with us a little bit more about your journal and what would happen if someone went through your journal, because I'm thinking this is a tool that can help get somebody through everything we're talking about in terms of self-analysis and being honest with yourself and all of that. Yeah. So the journal starts out with a whole section on figuring out what's going well in your life. I think that a lot of times you were talking earlier about how when you hate your job and you switch to being a creator instead, a lot of times you bring on the same problems. Like You're not actually coming at this from a place of love. You're coming at this from a place of frustration and anger already. So it really helps you get re-centered about what you love. Because I find that if you can come at it from a standpoint of loves and not just the love of work, what you love in your work, but love like what's going well in your family life, like it's supposed to bring in all of the things that are going well. So you don't accidentally leave them off because sometimes the things that are going well in our life, because they are not being the loudest, most annoying aspect of our life, we kind of ignore them. We don't value them enough. So I start out with that place of love so you can really get grounded in what's going well and what we want to keep, bring on with us, bring along. Mm -hmm. Because we want to be looking at our whole life, not just the business portion or the family portion. Like it all has to fit together nicely. It all has to fit together. Exactly. And then we go into the problem. Like what is it that you feel stuck on? What is it that you feel like isn't working Where do you feel like you don't have the room to grow the way you want to grow? And then we just start really going through it and clarifying. Like, Are there things that you could change in the here and now that would get you to where you want to be quicker and you're just looking at the problem in the wrong way? Mm, That is really good. Because I think sometimes we do. If we're looking at the problem the same way over and over and over again, it's very hard to have those aha moments that really pull us out of ourselves. So at some level, I feel like just someone else asking you these questions may give you the aha moment that you need to move forward that you wouldn't have been able to ask yourself. Yeah. Okay. I have a scenario I'm thinking about. Okay. So let's say somebody doesn't like their job and they make jewelry on the side. And there have been people who are saying, oh my gosh, you should start a business because I love this jewelry. I know everyone would buy this. And like you could leave that job that you don't like. Right. So then that seems like an easy escape hatch, not remembering everything it takes to start a business and whether you'd really like doing that in the first place. Maybe, maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. Right. Like, I don't want to talk anyone out of doing that because this is what I teach people to do. Right. (laughs) But that seems like the easy jump ship and go that way when actually, and what you just said, Becca, is maybe there's something else you can do in your job, like work under a new department who has a boss that you just get along with better, or maybe change what you're doing actually within the business overall, or going to a new business in the same industry because you already have experience. And again, I'm not trying to sell somebody out of starting their own business either. But you're being realistic. There are other solutions. And maybe you find a place where you are happier with what you're currently doing. And if you still want to start that beating business, then you could start it slowly on the side if you wanted. But I think what you were just saying and what it really triggered to me, can you tell, (laughs) is look at all of your options. Don't just look at one option and go with that. And that's what your journaling can help you dive into. 
Well, and I think that people don't notice all the possibilities. Like if you hate your job, unless you have a lot of money in the bank, and I do sometimes work with people, you know, who have a trust fund and (laughs) they can jump ship really easily, but most people can't do that. And so if you really hate your job, probably the best place to start with is to get a different job even if you're going to continue with the jewelry, because if you hate your job, it's taking up so much emotional energy that would be better spent on your business. And so I would never encourage someone to jump ship to being from a full-time employee to having their own small business, unless they had either a really proven track record or a lot of money in the bank. Or no choice because they get furloughed or laid off or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that works too if you're getting unemployment. But even then, I think sometimes people will just wait too long to start job searching. And also ignore the possibility of getting a job that works remote or getting a job that only requires 30 hours a week. And these jobs actually exist. And I find it really funny because it really just depends on your mindset. If someone has told themselves that, oh, I could never find that, well, they're not going to find it because they're not really looking for it. I have one client who's been a client. You know, I have a lot of repeat clients who I work with them on one job search. And then three years later, I work with them on another job search. And then three years later. And so I have one client who I've been working with for quite a long time. And she literally will only take remote jobs. And she's been doing this for 10 years. At the beginning of it, she was the first client, I think, that told me I only want to work remote. And at the beginning, I was like, is that a thing? Like, can you actually just look for jobs that are remote? And so she taught me something. She taught me, yes, you can really find jobs that are only remote if you're creative about how you do the search in LinkedIn and are really clear that you'll only take jobs. You know, if you're clear up front with people, I will only take this if it's remote, then you don't waste your time on lots of interviews that you're not going to get the job. Well, and the opportunities are so vast these days. And the opportunities are so vast. You know, remote, not remote, relocate, part-time, full-time, so many options. And if you're a good employee, like if you haven't hit the burnout, I mean, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about that plate where you hate your job, but there's also the people that just want a new creative challenge and they feel a little bit underutilized at their current job, but it's not that they hate it. It's just, they want something new. They want this new business because it's where their passion lies. And for those people, I'd really encourage you, if you know your boss likes you and financially you can swing it, talk to them about going to 25 hours a week. See where that conversation leads. In my experience, about 60% of people are able to negotiate it. And people spend years thinking it's all or nothing and wasting so much time when they really could have just gone 25%. And then they have the security. And quite frankly, like if the business doesn't work out in the timeline they need it to, they have a job. And a lot of times the people liked them so much that like as soon as they have an opening, they'll hire you back full time. And so I would encourage anyone who like isn't at that point where they hate their job to really look at those options of within the company that you're at or within like a either a competitor or, you know, a partner company that people know you really well. Be open to looking for those opportunities so that you can kind of have the best of both worlds. Good point. Love that you included that here. Okay, let's finish off with circling up on the Clarity Journal and what's included there. So you talked a little bit about already analyzing your current situation, then looking at all of the options and being creative with what those options would be. And then... Really starting to build the big picture, like go deep into all of your dreams, go deep into your likes, your strengths, what it looks like for you to use all of your strengths, go into maybe where your weaknesses are. Like if you know that you're not a super organized person, having your own business where you have to keep track of lots of orders, you're probably going to need you to use some sort of drop shipping, you know, like, like being aware of what your strengths and weaknesses are really helps you kind of clarify what the end goal is going to be. And then at the very end of the journal, I have space to really break it down. Like you come up with the big thing you want and what steps you'd need to take over the next three years to really have that happen in a 
way that is both realistic and expansive. So it's really self-reflection, documenting where you're at, where you want to go with reality overlays, thinking of all the creative solutions, because there's not just one solution, and then developing the plan, the master plan. Exactly. Love it. Totally needed. Thank you. (laughs) Wonderful. And where could people go and check out the journal? It's on Amazon. So you can just type in Clarity Journal into the search bar. I mean, you can also go to my website. I'm at BeccaRibbing.com and then Becca Ribbing on Instagram and Twitter. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think all of this conversation has been so valuable, not just for people who are starting, but people who are making a transition. And again, I'm going to close this by saying we are so fortunate in this day and age where we can make changes. We're not stuck working at one company for our whole entire lifetime. And it's acceptable now to work at home, to work for someone else, to work for yourself, you know, to be in an office, all different combinations. But it also then presents so many options that people can get confused. And this is where the Clarity Journal comes in. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show, for sharing with us your expertise, for walking us through what the Clarity Journal is all about. I think we've given a lot of people some things to think about and a path forward, most importantly. Thank you so much for having me. Were you as surprised as I was to get a different take on self-care? It's only a Band-Aid, not the solution. Food for thought, for sure. Next week, I have a treat for you. A business started due to a laundry accident. You just never know where inspiration will come from, I guess. The story behind this business is a great lesson in always keeping your eyes open for opportunity and how to make big things happen. As always, thanks so much for spending time with me today. If you're so inclined, a rating and review on Apple Podcasts would put a huge smile on my face. Just answer this question, why do you like this show? Or what have you learned recently from one of the podcast episodes? To make it really easy, just go to giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash review, or you can do it right on your favorite listening app. Thanks. And now be safe and well, and I'll see you again next week on the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. I want to make sure you're familiar with my free Facebook group called Gift Biz Breeze. It's a place where we all gather and are a community to support each other. I've got a really fun post in there that's my favorite of the week, I have to say, where I invite all of you to share what you're doing, to show pictures of your product, to show what you're working on for the week, to get reaction from other people, and just for fun, because we all get to see the wonderful products that everybody in the community is making. My favorite post every single week, without doubt. Wait, what? Aren't you part of the group already? If not, make sure to jump over to Facebook and search for the group Gift Biz Breeze. Don't delay. Come join us in Gift Biz Breeze today.